Welcome back, all my unconventional people out there. I was able to find a very smart, interesting, unconventional guy, Eric Calder, with us today. He is an expert in the technology space within finance. He's been working in finance. It was his first job out of high school, I believe. He's, he got into the finance game, and he actually started reading about crypto when the first white paper came out over 10 years ago. And he's looking to shift the world's power structure when it comes to the money, because he has been said, and I believe this is the quote, so Eric can correct me, make sure I got it right. Money is the ultimate product and money is broken. So happy to have <laughs> Eric on the chat about all that. Thanks for hopping on. And uh, well, Yeah, it's, it's actually funny to, uh, I have to say you've done some research because uh, uh, it's rare that someone quotes me that way. Uh, but it's 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 nice to know that um, that message is sort of um, it's 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 reaching across. Totally. And before we connected, I was seeing your presentation and what you were speaking about in regards to figuring out how to make the world's currency more fair to not just Americans that dominate the currency you know, with dollars, but ultimately figuring out how to level the playing field. And you were talking about how there's like all these coins out there versus what I remember is before like the financial crisis, how many banks there used to be and now how few banks there are. And I always yeah. think about like crypto coins are kind of like that. You know, the, the good coins are going to be there and the bad coins are, you know, just a load of crap. So how did you... How did you stumble across the white paper back in 2012? Because back in 2012, no one was talking about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, or anything about the blockchain. Um, that's actually kind of a funny story. So, um, you know, my beginnings were actually in tech, not in finance per se, right? I, I began doing technology within banks. Uh, in fact, my first client was um, was a specialized kind of bank known as a primary dealership. These are large institutions that um, belong to a, a kind of an informal club um, that gets the, the, the privilege of showing up to treasury auctions and buying large blocks of debt and they trade these this debt and it's big capital you're talking about, right? Especially when I was um, when I was just starting, it was that period uh, after uh, Reagan who had ballooned uh, government debt, and so there was um, you know I was working at a trading desk um, under um, a Dutchman actually, um, very distinguished posh individual, and he would pick up the phone and say, "Well, take." I'll take a quarter of that or something. And that meant a quarter billion dollars, right? So I'll take a half of that. And uh, and at the time, I couldn't even wrap my head around what a billion dollars was, right? Um, so, uh, so being right in the heart of finance, uh, I thought, well, I need to get more educated about this. And I read this book called uh, The Secrets of the Temple. It was published by one Wall Street Journal journalist, and it really went into depth about the, the genesis of the Federal Reserve and all the way through to Paul Volcker, who, who um, you know, managed to, or managed to contain the inflation shocks of the 70s, the oil shocks and all that. Um, so, I, um, so I was in that space the whole time. And at some point, I, you know, decided, well, I, you know, I should be investing. And so uh, I started to understand how to invest from a fundamental perspective. And I had holdings like Tyco and, uh, and you know, various things. Um, and I was into the Q ratios and I was into, you know, the percentage that manager management holds and the outlook of the market and doing all of that kind of research. And ultimately what I discovered was you know, uh, things just just went downhill. Um, Tyco, uh, the president Kozlovsky, I remember now his name, um, 
he decides one day that he's going to throw his 30 year old wife a party in Corsica. And uh, that little birthday party costs about $8 million, which he promptly <laughs> built the company. Right. And there's, you know, that all comes out later in an investigation of malfeasance and, um, and all this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, the, the shareholders got ripped off. I was one of the shareholders, right? And then there was uh, global crossings and there were, you know, it's just, just like one thing after the other, right? And I started to understand, you know, the, um, the CFOs cook the books, the, the CEOs do this and that, and the boards are all complicit and nobody gives a shit about the product. Nobody cares about the, the relationships with the vendors. Nobody cares about, about the shareholders, right? It was all a great scam. And I lost money. I think one of the biggest things that I, I had invested in a company called uh, U6. And U6 was amazing. It was basically one of the first ASPs out there, right? An application service provider where software, rather than being installed in your local thing, it's done through the web, right? And that made that model made all the sense. And I, I put in a lot of money into that. And when when it fell from like $78 to $50, I thought, oh my God, what a great opportunity. And I doubled up and then it fell to $20. And I thought, wow, well, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. This is my macro play, right? And then it fell to $3 and then it delisted. And I was like, oh my God, I okay. There is something fundamentally wrong with my approach to to investing in fundamentals because the fundamentals are rotten right the the whole system in fact is completely rotten so i should be trading i should be trading i should instead of investing i should be trading right and then i've i went down that rabbit hole learning elliott wave learning you know learning stochastics learning rsi and um and all of these kinds of, you know, the moving averages and the support and resistance lines and all that kind of stuff. And I did terribly. I lost a lot of money that way. Too. And then I then I got to that point where I said, OK, these were the two choices, fundamentals and, and, and pictures. And so I'm obviously a terrible investor. Oh, yeah, I, pray, I, I played with I followed some some uh, guys that did options trading on uh, futures contracts and. I made a lot of money uh, on orange juice. Orange juice was amazing for me. And I promptly lost it all in soybeans. And then I made a lot of money in sugar and I lost it in aluminum. I don't remember. Anyway, it was net zero for me. And at that point, I said, oh, then I, then I said, you know what the problem is, is that I need to be invest investing in things that I have direct control over. So I, uh, I was in Peru and I met this uh, wonderful lady who told me about this uh, laundry dry cleaners that if you just had the money she could she knew how to run it she had the market all then i said okay i'll give you the money and and i made an investment i made, I made, became a partner and uh, she promptly blew all the money and she did absolutely nothing with it i was like oh god okay then i invested in a an olive mill in chile uh, and I went about investing in all various things. And, I, and, and by the way, I was into gold and silver at some point, you know, it's, like, it's all just loss. Then I got to the point where I said, okay, I'm obviously not an investor. Uh, you know, I'd be better to just do nothing. Just stop. It's a, it sounds and, like you could have been the world's greatest short seller. <laughs> yes. Like, well, believe me, I had that thought. I thought... <laughs> Whatever decision I think I should do, I should do exactly the opposite. And I, I, uh, I, that was a mistake too. Um, I started to understand that the markets will always do something as difficult as it seems. They will always do something that you didn't think about, right? They, they just have this uncanny ability to always contradict you. So I thought, okay, that's it. I'm done. I, I, I'm just going to hold on to what I've got. Which of course is a form of investment, right? If you hold on to dollars, that is an investment, and that was a lesson that I had yet to learn. But it was at that point that some guy came to me and he said, "Hey, have you heard about Bitcoin?" I'm like, "No, what is that?" And he said, "Well, you can invest in it, and you're going to make a lot of money." And I'm like, "No, 
I'm that's like no, I'm not doing that. And he goes, no, listen, read the white paper. I'm like what's white paper? So he pointed me right, and I went and I read, you know, the five pages of it or whatever. And it was like mind blown. Like my girlfriend likes it, she likes it. She's like, okay, mind blown. I was just stunned, and I thought this changes everything. This is integrity. This is something I can trust. It's a machine. It's not going to cheat me. It's not going to cook the books. It's not going to run off with money or pay for its wife's birthdays or, you know, and I don't have to predict it. I don't have to trade the the curves and the support lines and the resistance lines. I just buy it. That's it, which is really what I was looking for the whole time, right? I wasn't really intending to be an investor per se, but my realization over time is that when you destroy money, you no longer have savings. Then you have to be an investor to stay af af ahead of inflation, right? And so when I found Bitcoin, I was like, oh, gosh, well, if I can make this computation, everybody else is going to make this computation, and now's the time to buy. So I bought Bitcoin, right? And what happened next was I thought, well, now I just have to wait, right? Because everyone's going to find it and uh, buy it, and, and it's going to be amazing. And uh, no. No, oh, that's not what happened. No one wanted Bitcoin. Oh, Bitcoin's, you know, it's money for criminals, for drug dealers. Oh, it's, uh, you know, it. there were like a million things about, oh, is it legal? Is it, you know, I started to understand how people live inside of this box, this sort of construct of um, of prohibitions that have been set down by whom? Uh, by a very small group of people at the top, right? It's it's not law. It's not even policy. It's ideology. Uh, they've taken a, a great deal of time and, and an incredible amount of effort to indoctrinate the hell out of everybody. And so the first thing that people do is they ask, is it legal? Um, and and that of course that also leads into a um, you know we can have the, the sort of cr cryptocurrency discussion but we also can have the sovereignty discussion because these are these two things actually go hand in hand right um, having to ask whether something is legal before you do it shows a mindset of of a permissioned life right that's probably proper if you are the subject of a monarch but if you live in america should you be asking for permission for things right i mean the reality is that we have to have a fucking permit to blow our noses these days you can't do any you can't cut hair without having to have a permit from the city and some kind of education that they mandate or whatever you know it's it's silly but it's part of the indoctrination right and so then I realized, well, I, you know, I'm going to have to talk about this, right? And I, and I, um, I became an evangelist for Bitcoin. Bitcoin was everything I talked about all day, every day. Uh, and I, I still was working at the time. Um, my last client, in fact, was um, uh, Mitsubishi United Financial uh, Group. Mm -hmm. uh, which is a large, you know, institution. Uh, I worked for other large institutions. I, I worked for Societe Generale French. They owned uh, TCW, which is a trust company of the West out here. Um, uh, before that, I worked for like Mason, who owned uh, Western Assets, also up here. Yeah, and I worked for a bunch of, you know, various people in in that space. And um, so I decided I needed to. Essentially, my contract was coming to an end with um, with the bank. And I decided I'm going to just focus on Bitcoin and trying to make that happen. And if I and I'm trying to educate, you know, and it's been really uh, a crazy journey, a, a far more difficult journey than I imagined, but also a more enlightening one. I've come to so the world has gone through this period of awakening, I guess we could say, as a function of the whole COVID thing, 
right? Which COVID to me was an amazing experience. Um, I used to joke that, you know, that at some point, you know how there's these transitions in life when you're young, you own nothing. So you're, you're a communist, you think everyone should be equal and all this kind of stuff. And as soon as you make some money, you be, you you go, well, no, no, I don't want to pay taxes. And then you go, oh, communism doesn't work. I want to be a capitalist, right? So I used to be very much uh, very pro-anarchy, uh, having, having realized the degree of rottenness in the state of Denmark. Um, I decided the system needed to be burnt. And... Um, and so I was very much intent in that idea of destroying the, the existing infrastructure. And then something happened um, that something came along that really blew my mind. And that was uh, George Bush, uh, not George W. Bush, but the son, right? In eight years, he did more to destroy this nation than I could have ever imagined. And I thought, Wow, that he was like my he was like my hero, really, right? And I then I had at some point I had that Batman moment. You know, this is one of the Batman films where the cat woman uh ends up and there's like tribunals and they're really just like these monkey courts, right? Where they're indicting people and executing them. And she's like, This isn't what I thought, this isn't what it was meant to be, right? I didn't I wanted to destroy the whole system, but I didn't want this this sort of lack of structure and mess and so i started to change my mind and i i started to understand it wasn't about destruction it was about construction it was about building a better system and that is a, you know anyone can complain anyone can say oh things suck yeah okay that's sure they do provide a better solution right oh that's hard because see, you'll say, well, we should do this. Yeah, I, I, that's been tried, right? That didn't work. Well, okay, sure. Then we could do this. Yeah, that's been tried too. Uh, and so it turns out, we, you know, it's a heuristic process, right? We've we've been doing all these things. And if we ended up where we are, this is in, you, you could make the argument, this is actually the the best of all worlds. We tried everything and this is where we ended up. Um. But I think the, the, the fallacy in that argument is that we didn't try. They tried. The, the small ruling elite have zigged and zagged across history, across generations, and landed on a formula that works really well for them. But it doesn't work well for us, for the 99%. Right. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because we haven't tried. We haven't gotten up and said no. And this is really what, you know, where the sovereignty discussion comes down to is at least Americans. I, I can't speak for, uh, you know, British subjects. Uh, well, probably the French, too, like Americans, have a, a constitution. We have rights. For example, the the. Uh, the Constitution says that the Bill of Rights says you have the right to bear arms. That's it. It doesn't say you have the right to bear arms if you belong to a militia or if you're sane or if you are at least 18 years old or anything like that. Right? It says you have the right to bear arms. That's it. In fact, it doesn't even say that. What it in fact says is the government cannot abridge these natural rights. You're born, that's it. You have the right. You have the right to speak your mind. You have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and property, and these kinds of things. And the government may not, whatever, period, right? Well, that's pretty easy to understand, but that's not where we are. I live in California. I can't, I can't carry a, a weapon on my holster, on my side, openly. But I can't do it um, uh, concealed either, which means that I can't do it at all. So it means that that government, the government of California, is abridging, infringing upon my rights. 
And well, that's fine. It can violate the law, right? And until I do something about it, it will continue to do so. It, to some extent, it does so by my permission. And that's where the ideology part comes in. If people don't understand that they are ultimately sovereign, that it is they that have to do something about their own lives, then they will continue to have the lives that they have. And this small group of monkeys are going to continue to rule the world. So, um, so the, you know, so then the question begins, okay, so I get it. I, I should be growing my own food, right? Because I currently delegate that to big, to big pharma or to big agro. Right? And we complain about uh, Monsanto and the chemicals and the poisons and stuff and how they put this shit into our food, but we don't do anything about it. We don't grow food. I should educate my own children because we send kids to, to the schools and they get shot by some serial killer or they get taught how to have sex in the behind at, at ages where they haven't even thought about that and they're not even nearly ready, right? Or they get, uh, like uh, California just passed a law that uh, if a child expresses something or other where the teacher believes that, that uh, gender reassignment, I think they call it, uh, is necessary, that they're not obligated to tell you as a parent, that they can just take measures, right? Um, so, okay, I'm gonna send my school to these to these kinds of places, really, where I just basically I'm putting my my child at, at all kinds of risks so that he can be indoctrinated. No, I sh if I have children, I should educate them. That's how it used to work. It's my responsibility. I brought that that creature into the world. I should provide for it, not just the food, but the but the mental uh, context for the world that it lives in, right? I should, uh, I, I should learn how to grow herbs that uh, heal instead of delegating everything to big pharma. We complain about the horrible things that big pharma does, but we continue to consume their products, right? We delegate our security to the police. Oh, I can call 911. Yeah, and while I'm calling 911, they don't answer the phone. And meanwhile, those guys are breaking in through my door. They're coming in with guns and I'm waiting. Right, and I don't have a gun to defend myself because I delegated that function. We delegate our money to banks, right? We delegate everything in our lives. We're not responsible anymore. We don't do anything. And that's, so that's, so to fix the world's problems, we have to start by assuming responsibility for our lives. We have to do something. And if you think about it in a more systemic way, uh, yeah, the indoctrination part is for sure something that we have to um, we have to address and have to be aware of, and we have to counteract. And I think there's a big mo movement now. So returning to the COVID thing, COVID did more for awakening than I could have ever imagined. Just like Bush did more for destruction of this country than I ever could have imagined. So there's these sort of out of the blue events that happen that that are like in support of what I was already thinking about, right? Uh, and so when you think about the the problems, the complex of problems, it's so it's so big, it's hard to know where to even start. Um, and so after a great deal of thinking, you might arrive like I did uh, at the conclusion that the simplest way to the simplest, thing to fix uh, and the thing that probably has the single most the single greatest impact is money money is an interesting kind of thing because it's a control mechanism uh, and there are really two control mechanisms i think i talk about this in one of my interviews um, one is violence and the other is money and violence is a small lever you can hang a man by a public square. Everybody goes, oh, my God, uh, I'm not doing whatever he did. And you just put everyone in compliance, right? Um, but if you overuse violence, if you hang 10 men or 100 men or 1,000 men from a square, then everybody goes, oh, my God, they're coming for me next. Where's my shotgun, right? And then you have a revolution, and then you lose control. 
So you have to be super careful. The threat of violence is far more interesting, far more useful than actual violence. And you can back it up with a little violence. But uh, I think, uh, what was it, Cambodia right now, or uh, Myanmar is one of these countries, they just opened fire. Uh, the army just opened fire on the population. They killed, I don't know how many people, right? That's, that's how revolutions start. The other lever of control is money. And money is wonderful because it's pervasive. Everybody uses money. Nobody understands what money is. And that kind of goes to the indoctrination thing. There's a whole bunch of things that have been run as a, as a church, as a, as a set of secrets kept in a temple, well guarded for the priests and everybody else is ignorant. And then the priests just tell you, right? Uh, we're gonna read to you in Latin so you don't understand a thing. And you have to take our word for it. Money works this way. There's, there's. Um, now we go back to the secrets of the temple, the book that I read when I was very young, right? Um. So because money, because money is fundamental to to civilization, uh, because any excess capacity that I have must be traded for your excess capacity, and because ultimately barter doesn't work because of the, the coincidence of one's problem. Money is the solution. And so money is what allows us to grow our societies, right? Our capacity to trade with other societies and inter-society between individuals, it's all facilitated by money. So money is, is a thing. It, money is the thing, probably. Uh, we've always had it. Uh, and so it's practically invisible. And for a long time, we had real money, gold. Then they, you know, it was really the, the Knights Templar who actually learned it from the Persians, who learned it from the Indians, that you could have little sheets of paper. So what happened with the Knights Templar was they were busy with their crusades trying to conquer what is now Israel. Uh, Jerusalem, they went to Jerusalem back, right? Um, and so there were lords in in Europe that were sending gold to finance those wars. And then they had the wars and they were successful and they took loot and that loot was mostly gold and it had to be brought back to Europe. So the Knights Templar being a, a monk, a, an order of fighting monks were put to originally to the use of protecting the pilgrims that were wanting to go to Jerusalem. And so they were also like an army that protected the the shipment of gold and so they said well look we're shipping gold this way and shipping gold this way that's kind of stupid we should just um we should just like keep the gold where it is and ship little pieces of paper that entitle people to that and they learned that from the persians who learned it from the indians etc we actually still have a system called havala uh which works entirely on trust uh it's very it's old older than the, the knights templar it still operates um and so this led this paved the way for the delinking in people's minds of oh i've got my wealth in gold now i've got this piece of paper right which represents the gold which is somewhere and that brings us all the way to america where we had thousands probably hundreds of tens of thousands of banks that all issued dollars on the basis of you bring me your gold on deposit and i'll give you this little chit with the bank's name on it and it says x number of dollars and there was a fixed rate and and so there was a, an issue of can i give you this dollar and you'd look at it and go well i don't know that bank i don't think i trust that bank so no you can't pay me with that dollar there were thousands of currencies in america right and ultimately brings us to the creation of the federal reserve their need to be able to supply the money for an entire country and therefore to have the capital the gold, right? They they wanted to create the Federal Reserve, but they didn't have that much gold because they had to because all the banks that existed had the gold, and they couldn't just go take the gold from people from from those banks to create their little sheets of paper and have it be the same thing. So they needed gold, and what they did was they went to uh, what some people refer to as the White Dragon family. Uh, they're also referred to as the elders, so they, they go by various names. But it's basically like a business group in Asia that had large gold holdings. And they went and said, look, we'd like to borrow 
borrow some gold because we have this project, right? Um, and uh, they said, sure, we got a bunch of gold in Japan and some gold in Manchuria. And so they all, and the Philippines, and they all moved it to Indonesia, right? They created these things called the Global Collateral Accounts. And they named the president of um, of Indonesia the controller, the global controller of these global collateral accounts. And on the basis of this goal, they started to issue what we now know as the US dollar, right? And that allowed the Federal Reserve to take over the business of all the banks. And they essentially destroyed the banking system in America. They created a central bank, which Americans hadn't wanted, right? Twice, three, twice before, Americans had rejected the idea of a central bank. But, you know, there you go. Here, here we end up with the Fed and still things are, okay, I've got this sheet of paper and there's some amount of gold in a vault, but I can no longer redeem it, right? So that was part of the, the transition until, of course, we reached 1971 with Nixon, where he delinks from gold altogether. And now we just have fiat. And fiat is the ultimate control mechanism. Why? Because you can expand it at will. And so if I have $10 in my pocket and there are $100 in the world, I own 10% of the, of, of the GDP, right? They then go and print another $100 and that means I still have nominally in my pocket $10, but now it represents 5% of the GDP. They just stole half my wealth and I didn't even know it. I couldn't, I can't see it, right? So across time, you impoverish a population that is, you know, America has been a very creative, innovative, active population, right? We don't spend like the Europeans a lot of time with this philosophy thinking about how to position and reposition in our minds and how to, you know, playing all these dialectical games and semantic games, right? We're like, fuck that shit. We're building stuff, right? And so this is the, the source of wealth. And um, and we've built ama amazing things. I mean, we got a man to the moon and we, you know, we figured out the genome and all this kind of stuff, right? Crazy, uh, wonderful things. But um, this productivity is then sort of sifted away, stolen by the elite through their fiat games. And so if you look at that, you then say, ah, I now understand the incredible value of Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin is a monetary supply they don't control. It's, it's like a parallel universe. It is autonomous. It is transparent in its monetary policy, therefore can be completely trusted. It's a machine without self-interest. And so if I create any wealth, where do I want to keep it? Do I want to keep it within that entire thing they call the global financial system? That means equities, bonds, commodities, you know, all of real estate, all these things that are valued according to that system. Or do I want to keep it in Bitcoin? And the answer is, well, Bitcoin is the thing, right? And so, so that was kind of my journey towards Bitcoin. And then, of course, I found Vow. And I was like, oh, my God, well, this is like, OK, this is now the, you know, and I can I can I can talk about, you know, some of that. But I'm afraid I give you a very long answer. I have a tendency to um, to pontificate that way. <laughs> No, it's perfectly fine. I enjoyed the history lesson and it was cool how you started literally at the beginning of America and brought it all the way to 2024. Rep Yeah. Just, just to bring things to a close, could you explain what your shirt means? This is this is ever that. Um so um it, you know how there's taglines in like the profiles of various systems like an x you can put what you are right and mine reads something along the lines that i'm a technologist investor poet and nihilist and a lot of people take exception to the nihilism part right um but nihilism is the the result of in some ways of transcendence. Um, when you understand 
that um, there are all these fake lines. You know, we say, oh, good and bad. Okay, it's almost like you put this line in between and you go, this camp is a good side. But no, it's not that way. It's actually a spectrum, right? There's better and worse. Um, there's best and worst. Um, so there is all of these degrees and you realize good and bad actually can't exist without each other. They're just two ends of a spectrum of the same thing, right? And you start to understand how much of the world is actually that way, all these distinctions that you make. And then ultimately, the distinction that everyone makes when they're when they're probably one year old or two, I forget the, the, the exact ages, is, oh, there's me and there's the world, right? I am separate from the world. That's the, that's the first lie, right? It's a natural conclusion of the organism uh, or of the development of our mind, but our mind lies to us. And so, the, so part of the realization that you don't exist, don't at least you don't exist in the in the way in which you believe you exist, uh, is that there is no this and there is no that. This is here, and that is there, but there is no. There's no such thing as distance. That is here and this is there, right? So therefore, what I think I hold, what I think I own, what I think I am, that is within this sort of circle that I've created that differentiates the me from the universe uh, is actually over there. Whatever we think we, we have, we don't, right? We will lose, uh, hopefully. And so th this line I found in Korea, I was in Korea with my, my girlfriend's Korean. Um, and I saw a, a guy walking around with this very, it, it was actually written in Korean. Um, and I thought, wow, that's really, I really like that. It's it's very nihilistic. And I am, I am a nihilist, so, um, so yeah, so that so my message in some ways is a message of transcendence, of getting over stuff, of coming to understand things in a deeper way, and um, and letting go of the indoctrination and the lies that we've been subjected to for centuries, really. Well, this was awesome, Eric. It was fun. Uh, we Hearing... didn't talk about how. So yeah. we should. We'll have oh, yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk, 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 let's, talk about that, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Val too, because um, is is Val something you started? No, I wish I could claim credit for it, but it is, and it's actually a system that, uh, when I found it, I understood it right away as to the incredible potential of Val, because I had been working along parallel lines, and um. For probably two or three years, I'd been bashing my head against various trade-offs, um, and I, I couldn't. I went back to the drawing board probably three or four times with entirely new systems. You know, I, I developed a system that was based on, on a the, the idea was so I had experience with options, um, and I thought you know I should build a blockchain that automatically produces, an a put option against a position that someone takes uh, so as to protect the value. I wanted to create an asymmetric, asymmetric volatility in a chain, right? So that you could experience upside, but no downside. And you could do that with a put. But the question was who was going to underwrite that put. And so I wanted the blockchain to underwrite that put. And I had a system. I thought this is going to be it. This is the reason why no one's put money into Bitcoin is because the incredible volatility if I can fix the volatility problem, then everyone's going to pile on, right? Because then it'll be like, oh yeah, I can make money, but I can't lose it. That's a winning proposition. And one night I uh, I was you know, I wasn't able to sleep. I'm doing you know attack surface analysis in my head, and I realized there was a use case where the whole thing imploded, and I thought, oh my god, this this doesn't work, right? Um, and I was depressed for a month, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I went back to 
uh, I went back to the drawing board and I thought the problem is that I'm trying to use existing instruments and fit them into a new structure. And what I should do is I should do, you know, blue sky thinking. The you know anything's the limit, right? Any any structure that I can imagine, no matter how dictatorial, can I make it work? Can I? And I elaborated a new structure that was completely different. And again, one night thinking about attack surfaces, I realized, oh my god, I've invented the very definition of a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> So I went back to the drawing board again, and I did this four times, and then I found Vow. And I read the white paper, and I talked to one of the founders, and I understood that in the current incarnation of my own development, the problem was I was being too aggressive. I wanted to cover too much. Vow had done something that I was doing, but backwards. It hadn't occurred to me, and I thought, well, wow, that's that's just brilliant. That solves this and that and that problem. And because they're you know they're not as aggressive as I have, they also don't have to solve these problems. And more interestingly, they are um, already a thing. They're a commercial venture with a large established user base. So from the perspective of rolling it out and having to convince people, they're far far ahead of me. Because if I even if I were able to elaborate this this conceptual construct, I still have to build it. Then I have to go sell it and make you know. And they're they're already there. So I'm like, okay, you know, I scra I spent a year on EOS building software, right? The EOS chain which died. Um, and at the it was at the end of that process when I found Vow and I thought, oh my god, and I just I just scrapped a year worth of work and I went to work with them and. Um, if we, you know, at some point, if we can do another call, I can tell you about Vow because it's um, Vow is Bitcoin 2.0. Vow is um, is what Bitcoin could never do, which essentially Vow weaves itself into the fabric of commerce, uh, which is something Bitcoin never did and it cannot do. For so like Bitcoin reasons. is like the land, and then you need someone to farm the land. Yes, it's very similar. Bitcoin is a transport protocol, right? It proved the point that you can have real money on the internet. And uh, well, there's now 10 or 20,000 other blockchains out there that do the same thing in a kind of a sleepy, unconscious way. Yeah, you know, They just took that, they replicated, they forked it, they made some changes, whatever, but the, none of them is actually awake. Vow's awake. Vow's, Vow took it to the next level. Right, so um, uh, at some point we'll we'll have to part two. You know, part two with Eric will have to be about Val. Yeah. Well, awesome. This is great. It sounds like to me the message is: do your homework. Always do what you believe in, and never give up. So, thanks everyone for listening. We'll see everyone next time. Bye.